Yes. Come on, give him a hand. <laughs> How many of you have seen the original Lion King before? Just raise your hands. Yes. It's 25 years old. It's crazy. Do you feel old now? I've literally seen this at least 50 times in one summer, okay? I was 16 years old, and my little brother Daniel was two, okay? And uh, I would wake up in the summer, and I would walk out to the living room, and guess what movie was playing every morning? And then the rest of the day, Lion King. I texted him the other day, and I said, do you remember Lion King? You remember watching it with me every day? He's like, yep, childhood favorite, right? Um, but I was thinking about that. I was thinking about our church. I was thinking about Lion King because when you look at the movie Lion King and the story of Lion King and the new, the new movies, it's really good as well. But it doesn't, it doesn't hold up to the old one, you know. Like that's what a lot of people complain about. But it's such a good movie. But what I was thinking about is when I was 16, I would stumble out to the living room. I would lay on the couch and my little brother who's two would sit on my back and would watch the movie, Right? And then I thought about Lion King, and it's about, like, Simba. He's kind of growing up, and you've got the old generations, the new generations. And I just started thinking about our church. And I saw that video was amazing, by the way, was it not? And you saw a lot of young guys and girls at our church singing. We've got a lot of, a lot of amazing young people at our church, don't we? But we have another generation that's just a little bit older than me that is also an incredible generation. And I just started thinking about those two things, about the little boy sitting on my back, you know, and how we sit, younger people than me, sit on the generation of people older than me, all the hard work and all the hard effort that they have put in. And I just thought, what a beautiful thing that's happening at our church right now of the generations colliding together, that you got little kids. Come on, make some noise if you love that, if you love, love what God's doing. You got little kids. You know, a lot of churches are just like little kids and young families and kind of like the end. But we've got little kids with, in young families. We've got teenagers and kind of middle families. But then we've got people that are quite a bit older than that in, the, in your 60s and your 70s just loving life and loving what God's doing here. And we are loving what you're doing here. And if you're young, make some noise for some of the older generations, which is what I like to call young at heart. That's what our older generations are, young at heart, strong in spirit, right? So thank you. I hope to, I, I was young once, and I hope to be young at heart for the rest of my life, right? Okay, so the first Lion King made $1 billion, just short of $1 billion in the, in the box offices. And uh, the new Lion King made $1 billion in one month. Isn't that crazy? Very popular. Most people know the movie. What really stands out in the movie to me are all the songs. In fact, when I saw the new one, I just found myself breaking out, singing the songs in the middle of the theater, and I couldn't help. Akuna Matata, right? I, I couldn't help. Can you feel the love tonight? You know, I'm just going, right? I'm like, yes, you know? And uh, I was singing that to Jessica. She wasn't feeling the love that night or whatever, but <laughs> anyway. Um, <laughs> but I was singing the songs and just having a good time, and, and what stood out to me was the songs and then some of the incredible conversations in the movie, there's a scene that I'm going to show you a little bit later um, between uh, Simba and the baboon. And it is, it's like the tearjerker. Like, you're just like, what? You know, like, really? And, like, people say they can't even watch that scene sometimes without just, you know, like, tearing up. And so I just thought it'd be fun to, to do a message with the Lion King and just kind of finish Faith Flicks off with a bang. This is the last weekend that we're doing it and so it's just been incredible and can we also give a, a big hand for the team that did all the decorations in the lobbies everywhere all across the board come on I know if you catch this by video but you can't see this guy up on the front row up here he's got this hat he's gonna hide but Scott and the team the maintenance team they just kill it Let's pray. Will you pray with me? Bow your heads and close your eyes. Father, we love you. We thank you for, for who you are. What a, what a fun thing to, to have a church that's full of joy and laughter, that we can find truth in the word of God kind of based on Lion King and some fun stuff like that, Lord, that you're telling stories to us and through us, through the word, through these things we see in everyday life. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, if you agree, come on, say amen. 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 So if you look at the movie Lion King, Simba's life 
starts with a lot of just promise and a call on his life. He's lifted up, hoisted up before everyone as the king, the future king. And he, he kind of, he knows it. So he starts his life with a lot of pride. And he's just like, I own all of this. And hey, let's cause a lot of trouble. And so he does. He's causing a lot of trouble. And he's kind of being rebellious and prideful and arrogant. And then, and what happens is next he kind of falls into temptation. He goes to the elephant, elephant graveyard. And what happens there is his father kind of has to stand up for him. And then that really sets Scar off the enemy. And he sets out a plan to kill Simba's father. And he goes through tragedy and his father dies. And then he's sad and he flees that, that land. He flees his home. And he goes off into this worry-free, carefree lifestyle where he isn't following his calling anymore. He's a lion eating bugs, being lazy, not taking care of the pride, not taking care of the land, and all the things he's supposed to be doing as a king. And then he begins to make his journey back. And I think it's such a great and incredible picture of so many of our lives and how we start out with a lot of promise and a calling. And then we go through things, and we go through things on the inside, and we go through things on the outside. And the way I'd like to explain it is the other night I, uh, I was sitting in my bedroom and I realized there was a lightning storm going off in the western sky and our, our house faces the west. And so we turn off all the lights in our room and we saw lightning striking in the distance for my, me, my three kids, my wife. We we're all sitting there for about a half hour. Lightning was just lighting up the sky. And we're just like, ooh, ah, oh, you know, just like, I mean, and someone would go to the bathroom and then we would scream even louder because they missed the big strike that, you know, whatever. And for a half hour, from 9.30 to 10 p.m., you know, with a 7-year-old, an 11-year-old, and a 14-year-old, it was that amazing, right? And so we're watching that. And that's kind of like how life works is there's, there's trouble brewing around us, but a lot of times it's off in the distance. And we're not really thinking much about it. But then two nights later, there was a massive lightning storm right over the top of our house. And it actually woke me up at 3 a.m., which is a miracle because thunder doesn't usually wake me up. I enjoy the sound of thunder. It helps me sleep. But it's actually rattling our house, shaking our home. And I was like, oh, my gosh, are, are we getting struck by lightning? What's happening? Well, we looked at the radar, and there was lightning that struck about 150 yards from our house. Like, we, you can see the lightning strike patterns. And we're looking at that, and we're like, oh, my gosh. And that storm off in the distance, the storm we like to watch on Facebook, other people's storms, you know what I'm saying? The storms that we like to watch on the news and other people's problems and we're going through life real well. That storm landed right over the top of my house and it just wasn't fun anymore. But it, but it didn't hurt us. It was scary and it brought a lot of worry and it woke me up in the middle of the night. Just like a lot of trouble in our own lives. It's not really hurting us, but it causes us a lot of worry. It causes us trouble. And anxiety. And though nothing has happened to us, we're afraid something will. There's that kind of trouble. And then there's the kind of trouble that happened to us about a month and a half ago. We literally just moved into our new house. We get in, and it was kind of tough because our house sold, and then the month went by before we actually closed on our, our house that we moved into now. So there was a whole month of where we had to move twice. No fun. Moving once, not good. Moving twice, double not good, right? Right? We're in for four days. It's midnight. My wife wakes me up. She says, you smell something? I was like, no, I don't smell anything. I don't smell, what do you smell? She's like, I smell something burning. And I was like, I don't smell anything. I, I, can't, I mean, I'm, I've been asleep for about 10 minutes, and then I smell electrical. And I was like, oh, oh, maybe it's one of our chargers, you know, like shorting out in a phone. I've seen that happen before. And so I'm scrambling, and I get up. And I go, something's happening. I, nothing's here, but I can smell now this huge chemical smell in my house. I jump up, and I take off running out of my room, and I see a lamp in the hall that was on that somebody set a really thick book, notebook, sitting right on top. And it's smoking up in our house like this. And I take the thing. I take it off. I, I shut the light off, unplug it, take it downstairs. My whole sm house smelled like a chemical factory of some kind. And I got to, I got to show you the light bulb. Can we show me, show me the picture of the light bulb? So the, the rubber is melting over this light and dripping and hitting 
the bottom of the lamp, and our entire upstairs smelled like chemicals. Our kids are asleep. We're sitting there now, hearts beating a thousand miles an hour, you know. Whoa, now the storm's inside. Now it is causing problems. And I think that's how our life works. There's storms in the distance, there's storms on the outside, and then there's storms that come from the inside. Now, thankfully, our house was fine. We had to air it out for about an hour and a half till 1.45 in the morning, and then we went back to sleep after our hearts rates drop back down. But here's the storms that we face. We've got the enemy, Satan, trying to kill us. 1 Peter 5.8 says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He's like Scar trying to kill Simba, right? And then we have stuff that's coming from the inside. We've got pride and lust Instead of being vigilant, focused, vigilant, focused, and alert, and being sober, and being clear, looking for the enemy, we're out there desiring the wrong things. We're drawing the wrong things to us. We're, we're lusting, and then we have pride. We're puffed up. And, and that all brings temptation close to us and makes it real. It's now all around us, rolling in from the inside. And then we have pain. We have the tragedies of life. And oftentimes those tragedies cause us to act poorly. We, we respond to pain and tragedy in a, in a bad way. We take off running and we go hide. Mark 19 says this, But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come up in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. So what is it in the Christian life that shields us, that restores us, that lifts us up, that propels us forward, that protects us from our enemies, that, that destroys the pride and the lust on the inside, that, that keeps us from temptation, and that allows us to deal with pain? What is it? What are the things that God has given to each Christian, each follower of him that, that helps us through all of these things, whether that thing's coming from the outside or whether that's coming from the inside, what is it? Well, I want you to go back with me 2,624 years to 605 B.C. There's a man named Daniel in the Bible, and Daniel was an incredible man. Daniel had a lot of the struggles that you have and in, in way, in way more than many of us. His people were captured by the Babylonians, taken captive. Daniel was ripped out of his family and put into school to be, to be educated in the new culture. But every time Daniel was pushed down, he rose to the top. He rose up. He kept rising with all the struggles, with all his strains, with all his temptations, with all the stuff coming at him. He rose to the top. And at the pinnacle of his life, he was Days from being promoted as, as the number one ruler in the land. Only King Darius would be higher than him. He at the time was one of the top three leaders governing the entire world, known world at the time. And he's, going to, he's such a good leader, he's about to be promoted to the very, very top. And his enemies didn't like that. So they set out a plan. And they, they tricked the king into saying that if anybody else worships God, worships the king instead of God, rather, they would be punished to death and be thrown into the lion's den. But Daniel, what did he do? He was a man, the Bible says, that prayed multiple times a day. What did Daniel do? When, when the temptation came, when the storm came, when the worries come, what did Daniel do? What would you do? Daniel 6, verse 10. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. It wasn't the first time Daniel did this. 
It wasn't the first time he prayed when trouble came. It wasn't the first time he prayed when temptation came knocking. It wasn't the first time when, when pride was knocking at his door that he prayed. But this day was different. It's actually a little bit crazy what he did. Because imagine this. For 30 days, you can't do something. And at the end of it, you'll be the ruler of the known world. What would you do? Would you, would you stand in front of the open window and pray? Would you worry? Would you get scared? Would you go in secret? You know, would you get mad? Would you talk to the king? What would you do? We'd all be tempted to do all of those things, and I guarantee Daniel was tempted to do all of those things, but he didn't. What is it that God gives us to deal with, with the pain in our lives, with the temptations, with the enemies? Well, the first thing that he gives us that we're going to talk about today is prayer. Daniel prayed. He chose not to worry. He chose not to run. He chose not to hide, but he chose to get down on his knees in front of God and everyone and pray. Prayer changes everything. I want, I want you guys to watch this video. It's from, the, it's from the movie, and it's a conversation that Simba has with his dad. Check this out. That's not my father. It's just my reflection. No. Look how. You see, he lives in you. Father? Simba, you have forgotten me. No. How could I? You have forgotten who you are. So forgotten me. Look inside yourself, Simba. You are more than what you have become. You must take your place in the circle of life. How can I go back? I'm not who I used to be. Remember who you are. You are my son and the one true king. Don't you think? Yeah. Looks like the winds are changing. Ah, uh, change is good. Yeah, but it's not easy. I know what I have to do, but going back means I'll have to face my past. I've been running from it for so long. Ow! Jeez, what was that for? It doesn't matter. It's in the past. <laughs> yeah, but it still hurts. Oh, yes, the past can't hurt. But the way I see it, you can either run from it or learn from it. Ah! You see? So what are you going to do? First, I'm going to take your stick. No, 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 no! Not a stick! Hey! Where are you going? I'm going back! You know, prayer reminds us who God is, and who we are in him. When we go to God in prayer, we still have to deal with the circumstances, though, don't we? You know, what happened to Daniel? He prayed, and everything got better, right? No, it actually got a little worse. The king, in verse 16, gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him in the lion's den. Have you ever prayed and things got worse? You're not alone. The king said to Daniel, may your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. And at, first, at verse 19, it says, at the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called Daniel in an anguished voice. Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, may the king live forever. My God sent his angel, and he shut the mouths 
of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty. You see, God doesn't just see us victorious when we're winning. God actually sees us victorious right in the middle of the battle where it actually looks like we're going to lose. You see, God wants to put a picture in your heart that is so strong, that is so powerful, a picture of victory that when you are literally, literally surrounded by the enemy, you still are going to win. You can still say, greater is he that is in me than the enemy that I'm facing in this world. You can see, say, greater is he that is in me than the pride that's in my heart right now. You can see, say, greater is he that is in me than the lust that's in my heart. You can say, greater is he that is in me than the temptations of this world. God wants you victorious. And the way to be victorious is pray. You got to keep praying. You see, Daniel prayed and he went into the lion's den. And what do you think he did in that lion's den? The Bible doesn't say, but I bet you he kept praying. I bet you he kept praying. And you know what God did? He showed up. He grabbed the lion's mouth and he shut them. Right in the middle of Daniel's darkest hours, God got him through. But it starts with prayer. What else gets us through? What else? Prayer is the key, but you know, prayer always leads us to something else. Prayer leads us to something else. In the book of Acts, chapter 16, verse 24 through 25, we find ourselves in the middle of a story where Paul, the leader of the church, has been arrested and he's been thrown in jail unjustly. He was actually thrown into prison for ministering and preaching the gospel. And if you really want to know what the story says, he had cast a demon out of a girl and the city didn't like it because they were using her to help sell stuff. And he was thrown into prison. Do you remember when I said, have you ever prayed and it got worse? Prayer, faith, following Christ does not make your life easy. It doesn't. But it can make you victorious. It can help you actually win that battle in front of you. Acts chapter 16, 24 through 25 says, Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were what? Were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. And there's like a little bit of a connotation on that as the pr prisoners were perplexed going, what are they doing? Why are they singing? Why are they praying? Well, we know why they'd be praying because they're in prison. But why in the world are they singing too? Suddenly, there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately, all the doors were open and everyone's chains were Loosed. Come on. Our God is a big God. There's a progression here. Praying and singing. Praying and singing. James 5.13 says this. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. You know what's interesting about this word, praying and singing hymns? The word hymn is only mentioned in the New Testament four times. And every time it is re really referred to as something called the great halal. This is, uh, this is a song that they used to sing from Psalms 113 to Psalms 118 and Psalms 136 that all the Jews in that day would sing as a praise unto their God. But it was called the great halal because it was like a big praise. It was like, man, this is our, this is our big halal. This is our big praise. And you know, there's a word that we sing and that we use all the time. It's very similar to that. You guys, you guys think of what I'm saying here? Hallelujah. Halal. Hallelujah. It's actually halal, which means praise. And it's the end of the word. Hallelujah is actually another name for God. A shortened version of Yahweh. Hallelujah. Praise God. You know, I love that word, and it's one of the only Hebrew words that any of us sing. 
or even really know another one, Hosanna, out there. But at the end of the day, it's, it's really one of the only words that Christians really talk about. A lot of Christians know that word, and we sing that word. But we often don't think about that word, and we don't understand what that word means. But I just thought it would be, I thought it would be interesting just to point that out to you right now. And we sing this really cool song um, at our church, and we're going to sing it right here at the end of the service. But uh, we, were up in, um, we were up in Arkansas at a church, and we were listening to um, the praise and worship in the service. And uh, my wife leans over to me and says, man, this would be an incredible song that we could sing for the message that you're preparing for church about praising God and in the storms and in the battles. I was like, yeah, that would be. But, you know, that's only two weeks away. We have four worship teams. There's 11 services. There's only like 80 people that would have to go learn this song. And I don't want to be the bearer of that news and come back and say, hey, guys, guess what? I got a great idea. You're all learning a new song. Cancel the set because they plan things out a month in advance. And I didn't want to be that guy, so I... I sheepishly went into Pastor Chris's office. <laughs> and I said, hey, Pastor Chris, um, I told him the story, and I said, there was this really cool song, but I, I, don't, I don't think we need to do it. Um, but do you have any other songs that kind of talk about the same thing, praising in the storm? He goes, well, what song was it? I was like, something about lifting up a hallelujah. And he goes, we're doing that song this Sunday. I was like, we are? He's like, yeah, man. We've been learning that for three weeks. I laughed, but then I began to shout. And I begin to say, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, you are good. You're working in Arkansas. You're working in Florida. You're working in our teams. I was like, come on. God is so good, is he not? Because prayer, God speaks, we listen, leads to praise. You know, when something really bad happens, we're going through a worry. We're going through a tough time. It's really hard to start singing. We notice that? It's hard just to bust out into a joyful song when something's going wrong. But it's a little easier to start praying. And it's really bad. Some of our prayers look like this. Help. Oh, God, will you help? Right? Oh, God, take this from me. I don't think I can handle it. Oh, God, what do I do? And if you're praying those types of prayers, I want to encourage you today. Keep praying. Keep praying. Oh, God, help. Keep praying. Oh, God, take this from me. Keep praying. God, I'm not sure if I can get through this. I need, I need you, Lord, because if you keep praying, your prayer of, oh, God, will you please help will turn into God, please help to God is my helper. My God can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. Because when you start praying, you start rattling heaven. You start rattling the gate of heaven. You start rattling God's heart. And then when you start singing, do you know what happens? You really begin to rattle God's heart. God's like, wait a minute. I hear some singing down there. Hold on. That's some different kind of singing. That's not that kind of singing where people are singing because everything's going good and they're, they're on the way home from work and, and everything worked out and they got the big account. That's a different kind of singing. What kind of singing is that down there? That's the kind of singing of my children that are in pain right now. That's the kind of singing of my, my son Daniel who's in a lion's den who's about to be eaten alive. That's the kind of singing that is. That's the kind of singing my son Paul and Silas are sitting in a prison right now arrested for something they didn't do. What am I going to do about that? That's what God starts to do when he hears his children singing in those moments. And I think when God sees those lightning storms off of the distance, he starts tapping his feet to the beat, right? And that thunder starts rolling, and those walls start falling down. Real walls. Because you know what? Some of us Christians and some of you know that when you pray, it changes your attitude. In fact, some of you atheists know that. Scientists know that. They call meditation and mindfulness. But as Christians, we say something else. It's, a, it's better. Prayer changes the atmosphere. Come on, right? Let me tell you, it's more than that. Prayer, prayer actually changes our environment. When we say God's going to knock down the walls, a lot of times we're talking figuratively. But you know, God can actually knock down some walls when you start praising him. Some real walls. 
man, God's going to shut the mouth of the enemy. God actually shut the mouth of a lion, not just the figurative, spiritual version of the enemy. There's a progression. When you get to praise, praying, you get to praising. When you get to praising, you set a platform for God's power to begin to move in your life. Not just in attitude, not just in atmosphere, but in actuality, in reality. God can actually pay that bill. He can actually send that money to your house. Son or daughter, I know, I know the world hasn't worked the way that you thought it was going to work. But keep praising him. I know that you need a friend and you're alone, but keep praising him. I know you're worried about that son or daughter, but keep praising him. I know that you've got bills and you're not sure how you're going to pay them, but guess what? Keep praising him. Even if it's just a little bit, even if it's just a little prayer, even if it's just a little praise, because you know what? God can work with the littlest of sound coming from one of his children. God can work with the littlest seed of faith when it's coming from his son or his daughter. The Bible says that that faith of a mustard seed size will produce something that will move a literal mountain. You know what moves mountains? Billions of tiny drips of water coming together in unison and flowing into rivers can cut the Grand Canyon out. That's how that happened, like that. Tiny seeds of prayer, tiny seeds of worship coming together. You know, that's what we do when we gather together at church. We walk in together and we start what? Putting our tiny prayers and our tiny praises and they start rolling out of our lips on song one. And they start really coming together on song two. And by song three, we're, we're raising our hands and praising Jesus like, man, he's going to shake the walls in my life. And I want to tell you right now, and I want to encourage you, church, this is the place to really get it out. This is the place to really get it rolling because it's a lot easier in here when there's a couple hundred people in the room doing that with you. And then you can actually walk into your environment, in your place. When everything's going wrong and you don't have a brother or sister around, you can take what you've taken in this place. You can take what Pastor Chris has done or what pa Amanda has set up or, or whoever's leading worship that day, and you can start taking that. You can be putting that in your heart and letting that out, letting that praise out in the middle of the pain, letting that praise out in the middle of the temptation, letting that praise out in the middle of the attack, just beginning to flow, beginning to let it rise and let it out of your mouth. But, but church, I'm telling you, it starts here and it starts right now in this place. In fact, I just want the worship team to come on up right now. We're going to sing a song together. And before we do, I want to show you a picture. I want to show you a picture. Do you have the lion picture? Do you have that? I don't know if I gave them that picture. Maybe I did. Maybe I didn't. No? Well, I'll just paint the picture for you. How about that? You need to surround yourself with those on a mission the same as you. What's a single lion look like versus a pack of lions come running out of the woods? You know, if I was standing next to the woods and I had, even I had a gun and one lion came out, I'd think, oh, I got him. I got him. Got him, you know. But if I saw a pack of lions coming, I don't know what I'd do. I'd just cry and start praising him, you know what I'm saying? Like, Jesus, take me, you know. Whatever is happening or it's not, right, that's, that's what will be going through your mind. What do you think you guys look like when you join together as a pack? What do you guys look like when you start standing up and the, the worship team, team starts playing? Come on, guys. Join me here. Come on, join me right now. Stand up. What happens when you start praising the Lord from your soul even right now? When you, when you close your eyes and you lift your heart to him, when you start shouting, when you start dancing, when you start singing, when you start lifting up the great hallelujah, the great praise God, the great thing that took Paul out of the prison, the great thing that took Daniel out of the cave. You are part of a, line you are part of a legacy and a lineage of men and women who have praised God in the middle of the fiery furnace who have praised God in the middle of an attack, and God has come. He has shown up in big ways. 
Just lift your hands and start praising him right now. Close your eyes, start singing to him. Thank you, Jesus. Just start saying things like, thank you, God. Thank you for loving me, Lord. This has got to flow from you, church. This has got to flow from your heart. We praise you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. Come on, let's sing together. Take us in this song. Come on, let's give it everything we got.